Sorry, guys. I guess there's not gonna be any productivity today. I was making a video, and a cat sat on my lap. So, I guess if you want to hear stories, you'll have to sit here and pet cats with me. <laughs> Could there be anything more cozy? Welcome all to Dr. Plague's Cozy Horror. Let's roll right into our first story while this tiny engine of destruction gets comfortable. Sometimes, when we're sick and tired of being sick and tired, we'll take any amount of hope if it means we might go back to some form of normalcy. But when the cure turns out to be worse than the disease, sometimes it's a cold comfort. Well, Miss Lee, this treatment is experimental, but we feel it will improve your condition. All you need to do is sign on the dotted line, and we can schedule you for the first of the week. The doctor tapped the form like a used car salesman, trying to sell a sports car with no engine. The kind of salesman who thinks you're too stupid to look under the hood, and too desperate to believe the deal is anything but genuine. That was the beginning of the end of my life. My name is Pandora Lee, and this is my story. Two years ago, I was diagnosed with a debilitating bone disease, the kind that causes your bones to be very weak. My doctor sent me to a specialist, and after running some tests and running up a small fortune in bills, he wanted to try an experimental treatment to harden my bones. I was hesitant. Who wouldn't be? But could I really afford to be in my condition? The following week, I arrived for my first treatment. The waiting room was the same bland area I'd seen a thousand times. The sort of forgettable facade that hides the work that goes on beyond that unassuming blue door, between the show floor and the butcher's shop. Children moved beads along a wire maze as parents and patients looked through magazines that had been current about ten years ago. The smiling face of President Obama looked up from a table. He and Martha Stewart sharing space with Better Homes and Gardens and Highlights magazine. The magazines were only slightly more interesting than the paperwork on the clipboard I was muddling through. But I tried my best to ignore them. Miss Lee, we're ready for you. A young, blonde-haired woman in scrubs called to me, smiling brightly as she led me through the oddly dark blue door and into a hallway of the same color. Despite the buzzing overhead lights, the paint scheme made the whole place look shadowy, and I shuddered as she led me to a little room farther down. She showed me to a small, sterile room, with only a gurney and an IV stand to break up the emptiness. The room was blessedly brighter, a kind of eggshell white that verged on eye-watering, and I stepped inside and handed her the clipboard. Please take a seat and get comfortable, Miss Lee. The doctor will be here very shortly. As I lay there waiting, the clean white paper crinkling under me, I had a gut feeling that this was a bad idea. I chalked it up to nerves, though. It was just another exam, just another series of tests, just another meeting that would end predictably. I should have listened to my gut. As the doctor walked in, he smiled his best crest kid smile, and I imagined I could see spit stains on his teeth. I wish I could tell you that he was an ugly little man, some goblin who scared me or made me wish a nurse had stayed to observe our interactions. But he was actually very plain looking. Thinking back now, I can't tell you anything about him other than his big grin and his neat little mustache. It might have been easier if he were a monster, but I guess life is rarely easy. Well, Miss Lee, as you know, this is still experimental. It's in the early trial phases. You'd honestly be one of our first human trials for the treatment. But we feel you are the perfect candidate. I stared at him blankly, unsure whether he expected me to be flattered or break out into applause. He looked uncomfortable, clearly not getting the response he was expecting. Calling the pretty blonde nurse from earlier, he asked her to strap me down and told me to relax. The straps were scratchy, the clasps sitting cold against my arm and I found it hard not to squirm as she slid the IV in. The doctor reached into the hall and wheeled out a large metal canister. It looked like a fire extinguisher, the old kind with a hand crank, except for the face mask on the end, which is undoubtedly going over my face. He must have noticed my apprehension, because the too-big grin made a return appearance. 
Don't worry, Miss Lee. It's all very safe. He placed the mask over my face, the smell of cleaner mixing with something sickly sweet and acidic. Breathe deep, he prompted, and I took my first breath, his voice sounding as if it were coming to me from the lip of a deep hole. You'll wake up in no time. Then it all went black, my last memory being the stuff I breathed in tasting like the smell of cleaner my mother had always used when I was young. Then I didn't think about anything for a while. I was floating for a while, my body as light as a feather, and I could have gladly floated in that void forever. When I dropped back into my body, however, it was worse than any falling dream I'd ever had. I opened my eyes and looked around frantically, my body still splayed across the gurney as the canister pumped whatever was in the tank into my lungs. I felt a surge of pain rip through my whole body, and I jerked fitfully against the restraints. The scream ripped up my lungs, the gas clouding my mouth as I choked on my anguish. The nurse ran in, trying to calm me to no avail. Calm down, Miss Lee. We don't want you to damage your bones while the treatment is doing its job. The pain is only temporary. The doctor will be in to give you something for it and explain everything. Her words did nothing for the pain that drilled into my bones, and after what seemed like hours, the doctor finally came in. He had a needle in his hand. The tip slid easily into the IV, and he filled the saline bag with something. It was cold, the liquid flowing in like ice, but the relief was immediate. I lay back gasping, the sudden lack of pain almost as jarring as the pain had been, and the big smile hovered over me like a specter. The first treatment is always the most painful, but it seems to be a success so far. You might have some joint stiffness for a few days, but that's to be expected, as the treatment hardens your bones. As the gas hissed and the ice brought sweet relief to my inflamed bones, I lay there drinking in grateful lungs of air. The lack of pain was hard to quantify, but I became aware over time that it wasn't just the sudden burning that had gone away. The everyday pain I had gotten used to, the inflamed joints and the deep ache of weakened bones, was also gone. It was like someone had flipped a switch in me, and suddenly I was exactly like I'd been before. This may seem like a small thing, but when you've lived with the pain, made it a day-to-day -day part of your life, its absence is like a physical loss. It was like a kid who's had his tooth pulled, his tongue prodding at the vacancy where something solid had been before. When he spoke, I had to shake myself back to reality to ask him to repeat himself. We will see you in two weeks for your next treatment. The nurse will give you a prescription when you leave. Take it twice a day in order to keep your body from rejecting the treatment. Understand? I nodded, still a little dazed, and agreed to take the pills. I made another appointment with the similarly pretty brunette and took the nondescript little bag she handed me. She smiled, saying they would see me in two weeks, and I headed home. As I drove home, I expected the pain to rear its head again with every press of a pedal or turn of the wheel. The pain had become like a swarm of gnats, ever-present and buzzing. You never got used to it, but you became accustomed to it. It's never comfortable, but you look forward to the times when it isn't there. Now, it was just gone. I was driving with nary a pain or a wince, something I hadn't done in years. I should have been happy. But I kept waiting for it to disappear. Maybe that made me a pessimist. But I don't care. When you live like this long enough, you constantly wait for the other shoe to drop. I walked into my house, my bones still feeling like nothing so much as normal bones, and took the pills out of the bag. Reading over the label for side effects or warnings, I found nothing but the instructions on the outside. No name, no ingredients, no warnings. Just eight words in bold font. Take one pill, with food, twice a day. I opened the bottle and let a few of the pills roll onto my palm. They were white and blue gel capsules, the contents looking like nothing so much as the sugar on top of the snow caps my husband ate at the movies. As they sat in my hand, I noticed that they were oddly cold to the touch, and the feeling reminded me of the way the liquid had felt as it entered my IV. When they didn't immediately appear dangerous or try to bite me, I let them tumble back into the bottle and close the lid. I set a reminder on my phone for 7 a.m. and started fixing dinner. 
When I went to bed that night, I had already forgotten about them, but as I pulled the blankets up around myself, I felt a sudden chill arrow through me. It should have raised a sort of red flag, but I was still riding the high of moving about my home without any of the pain from earlier that day. A few hours later, though, I was awoken by an icy chill going through my body, followed by an intense ache in my joints. As I tried to get up, I felt every bone in my body tighten. It was almost impossible to walk, but after a few minutes, it eased up, and I was able to make it to the bathroom. I figured this was just a side effect of the stiffness the doctor was talking about. And after a warm bath, some of the pain had abated. With some of my mobility returned, I shuffled back to bed, hoping to sleep off the pain until it was time for my first dose of medication. The next day, the pain of the night before was a fleeting memory, and I took my first pill and started getting ready for my day. It usually took me several hours to get my legs to cooperate enough to make breakfast, but today I moved about my kitchen the way I hadn't in years. My joints felt fluid, my bones were as forgettable as they should be, and when I woke my husband up for work at ten, he looked at me a little shocked to find breakfast already on the table, and the kitchen dishes cleaned and put away. Wow, those treatments really did the trick, he said, taking my hands in his big calloused ones, intent on kissing them. He dropped them in surprise as a shudder ran through him. Jeez, babe, your hands are so cold. There was worry on his face, but I waved his worries away and told him it was nothing. It's just the side effect of the treatment. I'm fine, sweetie. Deep down, though, I was worried. I should have called the doctor's office right then and there and told them about the side effects. After the weirdness that had happened the night before, I should have been more concerned, but it all comes back to one thing. Despite the stiffness, despite the cold hands, despite the next two weeks where sometimes I woke up in the middle of the night and hobbled into a warm bath, the intense pain in my bones was all but a distant memory. I would have given anything to be done with the pain like that, and it turned out the cost was more than I could have known. Two weeks later, I arrived at my next appointment. I was curious to see if it hurt the same way it had the time before, but my reasons for going were twofold. I had taken the last of my pills that morning, and I knew that I would need more if I wanted to maintain this lack of joint pain. So I smiled at the nurse, let them strap me down again, let them slide the needle into my arm, and breathed in the gas like the good doctor told me to. The treatment was performed the same as the first, but I gritted my teeth through the pain as I waited for him to inject my IV with that sweet icy liquid as the gas did its work. As the strap slid off, I nodded through the closing instructions and shuffled up to the desk to make my appointment and get my pills. I moved as if in a dream, my body feeling strangely heavy as I climbed into my car and drove home. I jerked awake in my driveway, unsure how I had arrived home. I had never fallen asleep at the wheel much less sleep drove home, and the thought made me shiver. I grabbed my prescription and headed inside, wanting to get as far from the vehicle as possible at that moment. I thought about starting dinner as I trudged in, but decided to take a nap instead. It was early still, only mid-afternoon, but I was suddenly exhausted. I could barely keep my eyes open, and as I slid into bed wearing the same clothes I'd left the house in, I thought I was settling in for nothing but a couple hours of rest. Ten hours later, I shuddered awake into total darkness as an arctic chill shot through my nerve endings. It was worse than it had ever been, worse than any time before it, and as I tried to climb out of bed, my legs froze up and sent me spilling to the floor. I lay there, unable to bend my legs or arms, only able to pull them towards me like palsied claws. I was overjoyed when I heard my husband's soft snores from the bed beside me. He would help me. He would get me to the hospital. He could get me into a warm bath, and I opened my mouth to scream his name. My lips trembled as I prepared to cry out for him, but no sound escaped my chilly maw. I gasped weakly, his name lost amongst the short barks of sound while he slept peacefully a few feet away. I lay there with tears of fear dripping down my face, certain that he would wake up the next morning to find me dead. I almost expected to see them freeze against my cheeks. But they did little more than pool beneath my head and wet the side of my face. I spent that night drifting in and out of my new painful existence. 
It felt like I lay there for weeks, listening to the content snores of my spouse as my body was racked with freezing chills. I thought I would die again and again, and as the sun began to rise, I almost wished for it. The colder I became, the less the shivers seemed to blow through me. I still felt them, but my body had stopped responding. I was powerless to move, incapable of doing much besides watching the sunrise and the day begin. I must have fallen asleep at some point, because when my husband yelled my name, my eyes were startled open. What? What the hell is this? But he seemed to lose his words as he stood over me. I mouthed at him, asking him to help me, but he looked unsure. I, I don't... I don't know how. I wanted to ask him what he meant, but instead he turned to my vanity and fetched a small hand mirror. I looked back at myself, not sure it was me for a moment. I was looking at a perfect china doll as she lay curled up on the floor. Her skin was a perfect alabaster, broken only by the slight spider cracks that ran through it. As I watched, another chill coursed through me and I saw the cracks lengthen as my fragile form tried to shiver. I wanted to cry, but I had no tears left. Instead, I told him to put the phone next to me and put it on text-to-speech. I wanted him to understand, wanted to explain how this had happened, while I could still explain anything. He did as I asked, saying he would go get help, but I don't think he'll be back in time. It took a surprisingly short time to lay it all out, but I can feel the change beginning to affect my face now. My blinks are becoming slower and slower, and my throat's beginning to tighten as it stiffens like my skin. My lips have started to flake as I speak, the cracks in my arms likely running through the lips my husband loved to kiss. I'll be nothing but a beautiful statue soon, a curiosity piece for people to speculate over. But with the time I have left, I want people to understand how I came to this point. I don't know if it was the treatment or the pills, maybe it was both, but it doesn't appear to be ready for human trials. If they ask you to sign your life away as I did, make sure you know what you're agreeing to. The short respite from pain wasn't worth the hell I found myself in now. It's getting hard to breathe now. My lungs are laboring to pull in breath, and I can feel the same shivering running through them with every gasping pull. My eyes are fixed forward, my fingers forever locked together, and I feel that every word may be my last. If you make it home, Jason, know that I love you, and I'm sorry that this is where we must part. He doesn't show any signs of leaving, so... Looks like we have plenty of time for more tales. Have you ever received a strange gift from your parents? Maybe it was a lucky keychain or a piece of furniture that's been in your home for generations. Well, the subject of today's post receives a very interesting item and a very interesting reason behind it. So, if you like to hang dream catchers around your bed, then you should beware of the Dream Eater. Michelle huffed angrily as she noticed that her dream catcher had fallen off the ceiling again. She checked under the bed, behind the nightstand, even in the bathroom in case it had rolled inside. Nothing. No dream catcher. No sign of where it had gone. It wasn't as if this was uncommon or anything. Michelle had been replacing dream catchers for most of her life, but the older she got the more annoying it became. Michelle went to the closet and opened a box labeled Decor, sorting through dozens of dream catchers that she had inside. This, this just happened sometimes. It had happened since she was young, and she'd gotten used to just replacing them. She picked up a frilly pink one, the leather around the ring dyed to match, but put it back. This one had been a gift, and she didn't want to waste it. She settled on a cheap neon blue one from the gas station and attached it to a hook over her bed. She hated to buy more, but the alternative was worse. The alternative was something that she hadn't experienced since she was very young. Michelle's mother had been fiercely spiritual. Trina Jones had stood out like a sore thumb among the community of strict Baptists and Methodists. Her mother had done a little of this and a little of that to get by. 
and Michelle had a tumultuous childhood. They lived in a little house that had been owned by her grandmother, and Michelle couldn't remember a time when her grandmother had come to the house for longer than a few minutes. She'd asked her why she never came over once, Michelle spending the night while her mother went to a concert with some friends. She and her grandmother had been shelling peas on the porch of Grandma's house, just on the other side of the block, and her grandmother's scowl had been hard to miss at the time. I hate to see what your mother's done to that house. It offends my senses, but God forgive me, I won't cast out. She's free to live her life however she likes, but that doesn't mean I have to let her rub it in my face. Her mother had an odd hodgepodge of beliefs, and Michelle could remember all of them jostling together in the living room of their small house. Trina, though her grandmother had always called her Grace, was an old hippie, and she had been taken with paganism and druidic ideas as she followed her friends on the road before Michelle was born. She had also liked the ideas of Buddhism, Taoism, and several other Eastern spiritualities. As such, the living room was often crowded with altars, statues, and other paraphernalia for whatever ritual or rite her mother was working on. The dream catchers were a part of it. Michelle had always suffered from terrible nightmares, and her mother had hung the dream catchers over her bed since she was very young. Her mother had also noticed the rate at which the dream catchers disappeared, but if she knew why, she never said. To Michelle, it was always just a fun mystery that never seemed to have an answer, like where the socks went when you lost them in the dryer. Michelle hung the new dream catcher over her bed and got back to getting ready for work. She had bills to pay and, inevitably, more dream catchers to buy. She found herself thinking back to the mystery of where all the dream catchers went as her work day slowed down. She tried to puzzle out where they might be disappearing to, but ultimately came up with nothing. As a kid, she had tried everything. She had nailed them to the ceiling. She had set up little nets to catch them if they fell. She had gone so far as to set up a little camera one night to see if someone was taking them. But the recordings had stopped at 11 when it ran out of tape. She hadn't really thought about it in a long time, but the more she pondered it, the more curious she became. She made a mental note to set up her phone camera tonight and see if she could find out what was taking them. The phone wouldn't run out of tape, unlike her video camera, and maybe she could figure out what was going on. Four nights later, and three deleted eight-hour recordings later, Michelle woke up to find her phone knocked over and her neon blue dream catcher missing. The video that she scrolled through that day at lunch was less than helpful. The phone had recorded the dream catcher until about 2 a.m., seeing nothing but the dust motes and the circles of feathers on the strings that hung from the ceiling. Then, at 2.07, Michelle heard a soft sound like a latch being slid, and the window had whispered open. A shadow passed over the camera, which was knocked over a few seconds later. No matter how many times she rewound the footage, Michelle couldn't tell what had knocked the camera over. It recorded nothing else but darkness for the rest of the night, until she had picked it up in the morning and turned it off. That gave her something new to worry about. Who was stealing her dream catchers, and why? Surely it couldn't be the same person all these years. She'd been losing dream catchers since she was three years old. She had moved two states away from her childhood home and moved into three different dorm rooms before settling into this apartment. It couldn't be the same person. But then, who was it? As she sat in traffic that day, she felt moved to call her mother, and as she dialed the number, she felt silly. What did she think her mother was going to do about it? Her mother had been a rolling stone ever since Michelle had left home three years ago, and the notion that she'd even be reachable was laughable. Trina had been the big push for her to accept the offer from Tennessee State College. She'd set her daughter down, pulling her away from her studies as she tried not to bomb her final and lose her acceptance letter. She told her that she'd been sent a spiritual vision and that it was time for her to travel. This vision didn't have anything to do with her latest man, Bo, and had everything to do with her wanderlust needing to be satiated. I'll stick around long enough for you to graduate, but after that, I'm hitting the road and giving the keys back to your grandmother. Michelle hadn't talked to her much in those three years, but she thought she might have some insight in this. She picked up on the fourth ring, and Michelle could hear soft guitar music and the sounds of laughter in the background. Hey, sweetie, what's the occasion? I haven't heard from you in months. I, I need to talk to you about something. I'm a little scared, and it's kind of important. 
Michelle heard the sound quiet as her mother walked away or stepped into some place. What's wrong, Micah? You need a reading or some crystal healing? I can send you some vibrations to the phone if you... But Michelle cut her off before she could get going. If she let Trina get rolling, they'd be on the phone all night. I need to know about the dream catchers. Why do they go missing? There was a long pause and Michelle was worried that she had lost her. Mom, are you still hanging them? She asked. And it wasn't the voice she was used to hearing from her mother. It was low and scared, at odds with her mother's usual gregarious nature. Of course, but I've been thinking a lot about them lately, and I just don't stop hanging them, Michelle. I know it's a pain, but trust me, they help. But why do I just... She paused as she got control of herself again. Just keep hanging them. If you need more, I I'll send you some. I know a guy out there who makes them, and he owes me a favor. I'll get you some in bulk, but please, just, just hang them and stay safe. Safe from what? Michelle asked, getting frustrated. Her mother had never been this serious, and it scared her more than the video had. Her mother clearly knew something, but she wouldn't tell her. She had never been good at keeping secrets, and Michelle didn't understand why she wanted to start now. I, I, I gotta go. Just... She seemed to gather her thoughts as she tried to find a way to explain. Just keep hanging them, and stay safe. I, I love you, Michelle. I'll send you some dream catchers soon so you don't run out. Then she hung up on her and Michelle was left confused and agitated. She thought about what her mother had told her for the rest of the night. The way she had acted scared Michelle and the transition from her mother's nickname to her real name had made it all the more jarring. Her mother had started calling her Micah when she was a kid, thinking it sounded more earthy and Michelle hadn't heard her use her real name in quite a while. She had started to hang a new dream catcher but paused midway through trying to hook it up there. The more she thought about it, the more she saw no reason to hang a new one. She'd had bad dreams when she was younger, but it was something that she hadn't experienced in a long time. Who's to say that the dream catchers had done anything? She froze there, unsure whether to proceed, and finally, she just tossed the dream catcher onto the nightstand. She'd sleep without it tonight and see what happened. Worst case scenario, she had a bad dream that night and would wake up and put a new one up. It took some time to get to sleep, but Michelle was sure that tonight would be as fine as all the others before it. When she woke up midway through the night, she was glad. The dream she'd been having was terrifying, but it was nothing compared to what she had woken up to. Her dreams had been incredibly dark. She had woken up in a hellscape, the sky constantly burning as the rain came down in runners of flames. She was lying naked on the hard stone, her body pulled close as she shuddered. All around her there were creatures gathering, their growls like thunder. She closed her eyes, trying to wake up, but it just never seemed to happen. She was stuck, waiting for these creatures to come in on her, and as the first lunged at her, its bony mouth snapping, she came awake like a deep sea diver from the depths. She thought for a moment that she was still sleeping, until she felt the pressure in her ear. She had never felt anything so intimate so violating, and the feeling made her shudder in utter terror. She swiveled her gaze to the left and saw something large and pale crouching beside the bed. It looked like a giant white bug, its body pale and wrinkled. It was hunkered below the side of the bed, like a kid wanting to ask a question. Its bald head gleamed in the moonlight, and Michelle realized that her window was open again. The long red tongue that slid over the edge of the bed and into her ear was as hard to miss as the pale horror kneeling there. The tongue bulged her eardrum, making her head feel far fuller than she was used to. It felt like it might be going all the way to her brain. What was he doing? Was he trying to eat her? What was going on? The tongue slid supilely out of her ear as his piss-yellow eyes grew large. He had noticed that she was awake. As it reached its full height, Michelle realized how big it was. Seven feet tall, each arm tipped with six long claws. As it loomed over her, Michelle worried that it would finish what it had started. Its long tongue slid over its thin lips, and they turned up at the corners as it took her in. Don't worry, it whispered, its voice high and waspish. I need you alive so I can continue to feed. 
I must admit, it's nice to get a taste from the source again. I usually get your tasty floating snacks, but today I got a real treat from the old country. Its tongue slid over its lips again, its face a rapture as it remembered the flavor. It climbed out of her window, its body groaning as its bones leaned into the twists, but Michelle felt utterly paralyzed. She didn't understand what was going on. What in the world was that? Had, had that been what her mother had been trying to protect her from? Had she known about it? Why, why hadn't she just told her? Michelle pulled her knees to her chest, the terror sending shudders up her frame, and as the birds began to chirp and the sun sent pink fingers over the edge of her window, she finally reached for her phone. Her mother sounded sleepy when she picked up, but it sounded like she might have been expecting the call. So, you saw it then. Michelle couldn't answer right away, managing only a small grunt of acknowledgement. Did it hurt you? It never did when you were a kid, but you, you knew it would come after me then? It wasn't a question. When, when you were young, you started having night terrors. You would wake me up every night with the most terrible screaming, and I didn't know what to do. Worse than that, you drew pictures of the dreams the next day. Flaming skies, terrible creatures, just the bleakest places imaginable. I didn't know what to do. One night, I woke up before you started screaming and felt like I needed to go make sure you were okay. That, that, that was when I saw it. He was leaning down over you, his tongue coming out of your ear, and he seemed to be drinking something out of your head. He ran when he saw me, bending out of the window like a serpent, and that only deepened my confusion. That was when I tried the dream catchers. It was on a whim. I, I didn't know whether it would work, but when it stopped your night terrors, I thought that maybe it kept him away. When they started disappearing, I figured out what was going on. She stopped, collecting her thoughts, and Michelle could hear the sounds of crickets making music in the background. Wherever she was, it was someplace green. Michelle could almost see the trees and feel the breeze, and she suddenly wished that she was with her. Was this why Mom had traveled so much? Was she running from something, too? Michelle suddenly realized how little she knew about her mother and wished that she had taken the time to learn more. The dream catchers don't do anything besides what they're supposed to. They take your dreams and store them inside those strings. Whatever these, these things are, and I mean things because I don't believe there's just one of them, they like eating your nightmares. The dream catchers distract them, give them something to eat instead. That's, that's why you need to keep hanging them. Michelle wanted to ask more, wanted to know if her mom had any idea about the places she saw in her dreams, but instead, she just reached for the dream catcher on her nightstand. I'll, I'll be in touch, Michelle whispered, hanging up as she stood on the bed to attach it to the ceiling. She wouldn't feel safe again until it was back in place. In truth, Michelle wondered if she'd ever feel safe again. Listening to him sit here and purr is kind of soothing. Makes me want to take a nap right along with him. We all have people in our lives that are important to us. I'm sure you all know how important you are to me. But sometimes those people leave suddenly. Or we may feel like we didn't get to say goodbye because they left too soon. It might be nice sometimes to get some final thoughts. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Final Thoughts. Final Thoughts would like to give our listeners a 10% discount on their premium package. Wouldn't you like the peace of mind of hearing from your loved ones just one last time? Well, at Final Thoughts, they can... Mark spooled the volume down as he waited for the commercial to end and his podcast to pick back up. 
He glanced out the window and was greeted by another sign for final thoughts. The company was barely a year old, and already they were everywhere. He turned the podcast back up, but wasn't really paying attention anymore. The traffic moved sluggishly around him, like an artery clogged with plaque. He just knew that it would make him late for dinner, and then Lisa would be upset. She hated it when he was late for dinner. The words of the host were cut off suddenly, as his phone chirped and displayed Lisa's picture on the screen. Mark sighed. She was probably calling to ask when he'd be home. She wouldn't be happy when he told her he was going to be late. He'd worked late every day this week, and she had probably made a big surprise dinner for Friday. He considered ignoring it, but knew that would just lead to a bigger fight. He caught it on the fifth ring. Hey, hon, he said, trying to sound chipper. Hi, sweetie. Her voice put Mark on edge. They'd been married almost seven years, and he'd learned how to read her reasonably well in the early parts of their relationship. Her voice was high, unnaturally sweet, and he could already tell that something was wrong. This was the voice she used when she was upset and trying not to show it, when she had bad news but didn't want to tell it. He almost thought he could hear her holding back tears, but didn't want to say so. Lisa, is everything okay? How, how was your day? D did you make any big sales? That took Mark aback. Lisa wasn't usually interested in his work. Yeah, um, I made a few big sales. Mr. Copeland said I'm likely a shoe-in for employee of the month. That's, that's fantastic, dear. I'm so proud of you. When she said it, there was a slight wince at the end of the word, and Mark could still swear that she was trying not to cry. She was acting strangely. What, what was going on over there? As Mark sat in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, he couldn't help but imagine that someone with a gun was in his house, telling his wife to call him. Maybe someone had died, Mark thought, and she was trying not to tell him until he got home. As the car ahead moved, Mark took his foot off the brake and accelerated forward enough to stop again. Just up ahead, he could see a road worker holding a sign. This was the gatekeeper for a stretch of road laden with roadmen and trucks. This was the source of the traffic, and Mark cursed loudly, realizing that this would take the better part of an hour to get through. What's wrong, sweetie? Lisa asked in that same overly chipper voice that verged on breaking. Oh, it's road work, babe. Looks like I won't be home for dinner for at least an hour. She made a sound, and to Mark it sounded like a sob. Oh, I'm sorry, hon. I was hoping you were a little closer. I had something I needed to tell you. Her words broke apart as she spoke, and Mark was getting kind of worried about what was going on at home. Lisa, is, is something wrong? You sound like you're barely able to stop yourself from crying. What's going on? I promise you won't get mad. I don't want the last thing I hear to be the sound of you mad. Her words sent a chill through him. The last thing you hear? What are you talking about? She paused for a moment, seeming to choose her words carefully before continuing. Mark, honey, there was an accident. An accident? What happened? A car beeped at him, and Mark jittered forward a little bit. He had expected to hear that someone had died, that dinner was burnt, maybe that there was a bill that had come in and it was really bad. He had thought maybe there was a home invader or a kidnapping plot. He had thought of a thousand different things, but her being hurt was never one of them. Lisa rarely left the house. When she did, it was always to her destination and back again. Lisa's parents had been killed in a car accident about ten years ago and it had all but made her a shut-in. I don't want to talk about it. Can't we just... Can't we just make our last conversation a happy one? I don't want you to remember me like this. After I'm gone, she said, finally breaking down. Mark could hear her crying on the other end, and the sound was too much. When the car beeped at him this time, he ignored it. Mark had already stripped off his seatbelt and was climbing out of his vehicle. The driver blared his horn and yelled at him, but Mark didn't care. He was running up the sidewalk, phone pushed against his ear, as he ran for their apartment. His apartment wasn't far from the office, but he always drove because he didn't want to arrive with his suit smelling of sweat in the street. He had always considered the 30 minutes to an hour it took him to get home as his time. Now we just wanted to get home before his wife breathed her last. What happened, dear? Just keep talking to me. Her voice was becoming weaker, but he craved it like a starving man wants a slice of bread. I was... I was dusting the lights. I dust them every Friday. They just, they get so dirty during the week. I was up on a stepladder, and I guess one of the brackets snapped. 
I fell and hit my head on the table. I saw the blood on the floor and knew it was bad. I'm sorry, Mark. I'm, I'm such a klutz. Don't be sorry, he said as he ran up the street. People moved out of his way or they were knocked aside. A woman fell on the curb and her angry voice followed Mark as he ran. Mark passed a policeman and the man tried to stop him. He juked around him and kept running. His apartment was only three blocks away and he knew he could make it. I'm scared, Mark. That gave him a burst of speed. Just, just hold on, I'm almost there, he huffed as he ran across the street, the sound of horns blaring behind him. I feel, I feel cold. Please, stay with me, Lisa, he almost cried, tears dripping down his face onto the phone. He could see their apartment building as it loomed in the distance. The gray facade had never looked better to him, and he knew it was only a block away. He ran flat out, his suit coat billowing behind him, his button-up hanging long around his waist. He looked crazed, but he didn't care. He was going to see her. He was going to save her. He was going to be there for her. Mark, she gasped. Her voice had become as fragile as glass. I'm here, honey. There's an ambulance outside the complex, as well as several police cars. What's going on? Had, has someone called for help? Why didn't you say so? I just wanted to let you know my time's almost up. His breath hitched in. Don't, don't talk like that. We'll have more time. I, I see paramedics outside. They must be here for you. No, they've already come and got me, Mark. He stopped as he watched them roll out a gurney with a black bag on it. The bag was zipped up, the contents not moving. The paramedics loaded it into the back of an ambulance and closed the door. They rolled away without ever seeing Mark at all. You're hearing my voice because I signed up for final thoughts. I know you don't like them, but... I wanted you to have some closure if something ever happened to me. I remember how much it messed me up when my parents died, and I never got to say goodbye. I've only got about a minute left, Mark, but I want to tell you that I love you, and I'll always love you. Mark stood on the sidewalk as the cold numbness rushed over him. He was hearing her voice for the last time. She was already gone, already dead and now he was listening to the last words she would ever say. This, this was grisly. It was a joke. How could they put a time limit on how long he could spend with his wife? Mark, she whispered, her voice a thin edge of dandelion fluff. He swallowed his emotion. This was his wife's final moments. He didn't want them to be meaningless. I, I love you too, Lisa. I've always loved you. Goodbye, Mark. I love you, she whispered. She sounded happy. The line went dead. The two comfiest feelings in the world. Listening to the rain and petting a beloved pet. I hope that you know those joys as well. Let's face it, telemarketers are kind of a pain, but there's something we have to deal with in our current climate. But when a telemarketer decides he's had enough of being the butt of someone's joke, it might be time he sent a message they couldn't ignore. I'm not proud of it, but when you receive one of those calls about your car's extended warranty, it's sometimes me. I'm a writer, a published writer, with an agent, a bestseller, and everything. Five years ago, I was number three on several bestseller lists. Five years ago, Oprah featured my book on her book list. Five years ago, I sat on Ellen DeGeneres and promoted the crap out of my book, a move that netted me the house I now live in. It was a good year for me, and when my agent suggested that I write a sequel, I jumped at the chance. Five years later, my sequel is finally coming together, but the bills don't stop just because your royalties and your residuals stop rolling in. My wife went back to her job at the grocery store, something to help pay the bills while I was working on my book, but it just wasn't enough. We had lived a little too grandly for the last four years, and now the money was gone. I told her I was paying the bills out of the residuals, but in reality, it was the salary I made working call center jobs like this one. Call center jobs are pretty easy, all things considered. You read a script, you call gullible people and offer them goods and services, you rake in little bonuses when you manage to trick the old or the infirm. 
It also allows me to work from home so I can proofread pages and research chapters while I cold call people in my pajamas. You get a lot of hate, a lot of people playing games, but that kind of thing is easy to ignore. Hell, I did retail for eight years when I was young, and it's given me a pretty thick skin. It was easy to ignore when you realized that whether you made the sale or not, you were still going to receive a check at the end of the week. It was a pretty good gig, until I cold called someone I shouldn't have. The voice that picked up the phone was deep, cultured, and I should have known that it wasn't a voice of someone that could be fooled with such a cheap trick. He was the last number on my sheet for the day, and I figured I had nothing to lose. Yes, sir, I'm calling you about your car's extended warranty. Do you still own the 2013 Link? Does this ever actually work? Stumbled for a moment, choosing to roll on with the script rather than break character. Lincoln, the, the warranty is nearing its expiration, and we're offering select customers a... This is the fifth call I've received from your company today, young man. I started to ignore it, like I'd ignored the others, but I figured I'd pick up this time and see what was so important. I see now that the answer was nothing. I tried to stay in character, but it was hard in the face of his frank honesty. Look, I'm, I'm just doing my job, sir. I've got bills to pay and a family to feed, same as you. If you aren't interested, then I'll... Oh, a family man! Is that why you take the elderly for their pensions and scam the mentally handicapped for their hard-earned money? Such a provider. I'm sure your children will be proud of their father. He said it in such a matter-of-fact way that I almost didn't register it as an insult. I could have hung up on him. He wasn't the worst offender I'd had all day. But something about his voice rankled me. Where did this guy get off? He was going to sit here and tell me how rotten it was to make my money this way, like I didn't already know. Where the heck did he get off? Look, buddy, there's, there's no reason for any of that. We're just calling to let you know about your warranty program. If you don't want it, then I'll just... He cut me off again. Don't worry about it, friend. I'm sure you'll have more prevalent things to worry about soon enough. Ciao. The line went dead then, and the silence seemed ominous. I sat the phone down like I thought it might blow up. I'd been threatened on the phone before, but this one... This one felt different. There'd been no screaming, no cursing, no invitations to screw myself, or questions about how I slept at night. I shuddered a little, suddenly feeling like a goose had walked over my grave. I jumped a little when I saw my son standing in the doorway, scratching his neck. Michael had wandered into my office while I was on the phone. I turned to him as he stood scratching, his hand moving up and down his back, before asking if he was okay. He'd been napping something he would have to give up when he started school next year, and it seemed that his itchy back had woken him slightly ahead of schedule. Daddy, my back is so itchy. I told him to go lay in bed while I grabbed the cream and the lotion. His mother and I called it Triceratops cream, something that always made Michael laugh, and it seemed to be the only thing that helped with his eczema when it got really bad. It's something he's suffered with since he was very young. We've had to wash his clothes with dye-free detergent, use special soap during his baths, and stay far away from things like wool. So I grabbed the cream and the lotion so I could lather him up and bring his itching to an end. As I slid his shirt off, however, I worried there might be something else going on here. Michael's back was covered in boils. A swath of small pustules with white heads were scattered over his pink skin, and they looked like pimples. There were clusters of small patches, islands of blight on a sea of normal skin, and I was honestly a little afraid to touch them. Nevertheless, I mixed the cream together and rubbed them onto his back, feeling him jump as some of the boils burst beneath my fingers. He seemed to relax when I finished, thanking me as he slid his shirt down gingerly. That was how it started. I wish I could say that that was where it ended. I was proofing pages when my daughter, Michelle, arrived home from school. She stumbled into my office, her hands scratching at the back of her neck absent-mindedly as she hugged me and told me about her day. We'd done this ever since her first day of school, and it was one of her daily rituals. She'd taken a test she believed she'd done well on, found a dollar in the storm grate near the house, and told Jenny that she was being mean to Sarah, so the two were no longer friends. I listened to her in a detached way, nodding and mm-hmm-ing as she talked, noticing her scratching her neck a couple of times. The scratching didn't seem peculiar. People scratch sometimes but I couldn't help but notice the red patch of skin on the back of her neck 
as she left to go start her homework. I turned back to my work, but sighed as I noticed the time. I saved my work and locked my computer. I had hardly gotten through half the chapter I was working on, but it was time to get started on dinner before my wife got home. The pork chops were cooking in the air fryer when my wife came through the door. I smiled as I turned to pull her against me, kissing the top of her head as she leaned warmly into me. She shuddered a little as my hands touched her back, but said it was just some back pain from standing all day. Mary called out again, so I was the only one working the register. Again. It was eight straight hours of standing behind the register, listening to people complain. How'd your book proofing go today? I turned away from her, pretending to stir the potatoes as I answered. Stephanie could always tell when I was lying. Pre pretty good. L lots of progress. I'm sure it'll be ready for my agent in a few weeks. That's fantastic, dear. I'm sure it will be as much of a hit as your last one, she said, pressing a kiss on my stubbly cheek. I smiled, but I really wasn't so sure. It all came down to this latest book, it seemed. I just had to finish my book. Just had to write another hit. I just had to find my way back onto the bestseller list and get myself out of Dutch. Easy, right? The next morning I awoke determined to get some work done today. I would make up for my lack of work the day before and end with some real progress. I still had over 200 pages to proof, and if I didn't get them done fairly quickly, there would be no time to send them off, and quite likely I'd have to sit through notes on a second draft. As I went to wake my daughter up for school, however, I heard the hoarse cough coming from my son's room. I cracked the door to find him lying on his stomach, his shirt off and his back worse than the day before. His skin was broken out in red, angry boils, and the small, white-headed blemishes of the day before had become larger and redder, their tips filled with translucent pus. He was softly moaning, his eyes begging for me to make the pain stop as they pulsated. My wife came out of the bedroom then, getting ready for work, and saw Michael's back. She ran to him, careful not to touch any of the spots, and asked me if he'd had these since yesterday. He was broken out, I said honestly, startled by the sudden appearance of the large angry boils, but it wasn't this bad. I put on lotion and cream, and he seemed to feel a lot better. Stephanie started talking quietly to herself, mostly arguing with herself about whether she could find someone to cover for her, but I told her I could take Michael to the pediatrician. Heck, what was the point of being a stay-at-home husband if I couldn't take my son to the doctor? She asked if I was sure. She knew I had work to do today, but I told her that it was nothing. I told her to go to work and that I would handle things here. I told Michael to stay in bed, not wanting him to aggravate any of the blisters he had on his back, and went to go wake Michelle up so she didn't miss her bus. I was in for another surprise when I got to her room. I opened her door and was immediately buffeted by the sound of her racking cough and her low groans from the bed. She was warm to the touch, not overly so, but definitely fevered, and I asked how she was feeling. She said it felt like she had the flu. Her throat hurt, she was hot, and her whole body ached. My wife was getting ready by then, stepping into the shower before she stepped into her uniform, and I figured it would be just as easy to make an appointment for two kids as it would for one. I told Michelle to get some clothes on, and that I would make an appointment for her and Michael. With all the COVID paranoia still floating around, it was pretty easy to get an appointment last minute with the symptoms they were presenting. One phone call to an after-hours nurse later, and I prepared to trade all my editing and proofreading time before work for time spent sitting in the car until it was our turn to go to the back. It was an hour and a half before we made it in, and I tried to make the most of it by doing some edits on my phone. It was slow and tedious, the two of them glued to their phones or their gadgets in the back seat as they hacked and coughed, but I managed to get a little bit of work done before they sent me a text saying they were ready for us in the back. Thirty minutes later, their pediatrician came back with very little by way of an explanation. Well, they don't have COVID, or the flu, or anything else that I can test for here. What they do have is a high fever, a very wet cough, and troubling boils all over their back. Michelle too, I asked, having not been aware that she was sporting boils as well. Michelle too, she confirmed. Her outbreak isn't as bad as Michael's, but it's getting worse. I'd recommend that you keep them at home until it clears up. Don't touch the sores with your bare hands, and if you happen to by accident, be sure to disinfect your hands with alcohol. Wear gloves and a mask when you interact with them, and go to the hospital if you or your wife start presenting symptoms. I'm hoping it clears up on its own, but if it doesn't in a day or two, you should take them to the hospital anyway. I bundled them back into the car, a handful of prescriptions in my pocket, 
and called my wife as I went about getting their medications and getting them home. All of this, the meds, the visit, everything, was going to cost some, and I needed to get them settled so I could log some hours at work. My wife's insurance wasn't very good, and the money I made would be crucial if I wanted to get out of debt. I also had to find some time to work on my book, knowing in the back of my mind that it was the secret to solving my current problems. Stephanie picked up on the third ring, and the cough she rumbled into the phone sounded suspiciously like the ones from the back seat. She swore it was just allergies, and commiserated with me about the diagnosis. She wished she could be there, but said that she would likely be late this evening. Mary had called out, again, and she was the only one working register today. It was noon before I got everyone medicated, set up in their rooms with lunch and toys and entertainment, and sat down at my computer so I could begin my day. As I took calls and proofed pages, I felt a little bubble of anxiety every time someone picked up the phone. I was still a little rattled by yesterday's call, but all of my calls today seemed normal enough. I actually had two people give me their information and buy one of the garbage warranties we offered. I had no idea whether they worked or not, but the company was paying me to make calls, not research their products. In between calls, I peeked in on the kids to make sure they were okay. Michael spent most of the day sleeping, his breath heavy and wet, and Michelle just looked at me whenever I peeked in on her, seeming listless and barely there. I gave them more meds and made sure they had juice and liquids, and kept an eye on their temperatures as I took calls in between my nursing duties. As the sun set, I began to get worried about my wife. She should have been home by now should have been home a half an hour ago, and I was just about to call her when I heard the door pop loudly open. She was laid out on the floor of the living room, her coughs deep and wet, her own blemishes peeking from the collar of her work shirt. I took them all to the hospital then, just bundled them into the car and went. The ER didn't know what to make of them, but we've all been quarantined upstairs now as I try to figure out why I haven't gotten sick with the same symptoms as the rest of my family. They are working hard to manage their fevers. All three of them are around 103, and they're laid out on their stomachs as their boils have become very fragile. They're afraid that popping them might lead to sepsis, but the longer I look at them, the more intrigued by them I become. I've been sitting in the room for the last few hours, my only company the beeping of their machines, and as I sat next to my wife, I noticed something strange. The boils on her back seem to be forming a pattern, the swoops almost looking like a picture. I sat stroking her hand, Stephanie groaning in and out of consciousness, and the longer I looked, the more I realized the swoops are words. Moving over to Michael, I can see he has similar words, all picked out in the pustulant boils that mark his baby fine skin. I brought my phone out and snapped pictures of their backs, the three of them requiring a little turning and moving before the messages were visible. I'm sitting here now as I contemplate telling the doctor what I've found. I don't think it'll help, but I don't know what to make of it either. I can't, it can't be what I believe it is, but I can't think of any other explanation for the words that I'm reading swirled across the painful backs of my family. The message reads, I've been trying to reach you about your car's extended warranty. <sighs> I think it's almost nap time for me, but I think maybe I've got just enough energy one more story. I can definitely be the first to vouch that some writers have strange rituals. We're, we're like bowlers in a way. We try to recreate the events that give us the best writing, the best stories. Well, today's writer is no exception. Except, like so many of us, he gets his stories through the door. I met my husband when we were in college together. I was working on my bachelor's degree, helping out in the library for some needed extra cash, when I first laid eyes on him. He was not the usual sort of man I fancied, more bookish than muscly. I found him charming in his own way, and we struck up a friendship. He told me he was a writer, that he was working on a book of short stories to submit to a publishing house, I offered to read them, and from that moment on, I became his biggest fan. His stories were so visceral. He wrote not as a writer, but as a first-hand observer, and it wasn't long before his work was noticed. We were living together by then, our library friendship having blossomed into something more, and I could see how giddy he was when the letters came in from Bowding Publishing. When he read how they wanted to publish his book, 
I think it was the proudest moment of his life. He kept writing for Bowding, his stories finding a niche with the horror community. He also started selling his pieces to magazines and online sources, getting his name out there and becoming more recognizable. As his fame grew, however, he still jokingly called me his biggest fan. I couldn't argue with him. I genuinely loved his work. He wrote the sort of stories that were genuinely terrifying and enticed the reader to keep reading until the very end. As his stories grew in number, I found myself curious about where they all came from. My husband, we'll call him Michael, was a mild-mannered fellow who had never really experienced anything horrifying in his life. He described his childhood as benign, no broken bones or funny uncles. His family was loving and doted on him constantly. He had never been without. He had never really suffered. And I found myself very curious about where all these nightmares came from in such a beautiful mind. Then, over drinks one night, he told me. He didn't like to talk about, you know, where he got the stories from, not when he was sober. He always said that discussing the creative process was boring, or that his story's technical aspects would bore me to tears. I wasn't fooled, though. Beneath his jokes was something colder, something fearful. So one night I pressed him. He still didn't really want to talk about it, but I persisted. Finally, after a lot of coaxing and some strong whiskey, he all but blurted his answer to me. I wish now that I hadn't asked. It's the door, he said, and at that moment he seemed almost afraid of his own words. The door? I was confused by the queerness of his answer. What, what do you dream about? He asked the question so suddenly I was taken by surprise. Oh, I don't know. Normal things, I guess. What I did the day before, movies I've watched, weird things my mind cooks up. I've only ever had the same dream my entire life. It's always the same. It never changes. It's where I get all my ideas. I leaned forward, intrigued by what he was telling me. He seemed emboldened by my attention. The door lies in space. At least I believe it must be space. It floats in a great void, and every night I visit it. I float through this void naked, an umbilicus connecting me to whatever lies beyond. Every night I approach the door, and every night it whispers to me through the keyhole. Do you remember the little journal on my bedside? I nodded, begging him to go on with my eyes. I've trained myself to write the things I hear while sleeping. Sometimes I see pictures or faces when I look through the keyhole. Sometimes I hear terrible words spoken by creatures I imagine to be beyond my description. Sometimes I have to close my eyes and will myself awake because I'm afraid that the things they tell me will drive me insane. When I wake up, I read what I've written down, which becomes my stories. I was shocked. So all your stories come from this big door in space? He smiled at me. It sounds silly when you say it like that, but yes, everything I've ever written was spoken to me by something on the other side of that door. I didn't think anything of it the next day. We had been drunk, and he had just spouted off something to make me shut up. I was sure of it. I became more aware of his journal, though. Sometimes at night he would wake me up with the scritch-scratch of his pen on the page. I didn't like to look at him when he was writing it. It was like something otherworldly had taken his strings and was using him without his permission. Watching him write in that fugue state made me feel uncomfortable, and I took measures not to be awake while it was going on. I didn't think anything else of this, not until about three months ago. That was when he started having the nightmares. His work had always been creepy, always terrifying, but now it took on an alarming quality. He began talking about creatures that lived beyond the door. These creatures sounded more than a little Lovecraftian, and he was assured that their presence on Earth was an affront to the natural order. They came and went, their arrivals marked by some with great portents, and their battles had shaped history. The stories weren't the only thing that changed, though. He began to sleep poorly. His sleep had always been placid, peaceful, but now he thrashed and mumbled in his sleep. He whimpered in the night about the pale lady or the green man and the riotous red that surged like blood. The words he wrote in his journal were unreadable, 
a foreign language. But he sat and scribbled them, transcribed them every morning, like a dutiful follower of some religion. He began to change. His eyes bore huge bags. He was jumpy and unsure of himself, and more than once I caught him catnapping fitfully during the day. His writing, however, was more in demand than ever. The magazines he wrote for wanted more stories about these strange old ones. His editor wanted to publish a compilation of them at once. He had no lack of material for the book, but I began to get worried about his health as he proceeded. We had been married for two years then, just starting to make a life together, and I was afraid that his candle would burn out before mine. I asked him one night to stop writing the stories. He was at his computer, typing away dutifully, when I made the request. He turned his head to look at me, haunted eyes boring into mine, and laughed for the first time in weeks. It wasn't his laugh, though. The laughter was jagged and full of despair, humor shared only by the damned. He laughed like a madman. <laughs> I can't. If I stop writing, they won't like it. Who? I asked in confusion. The ones... the ones behind the door. They've marked me as their chronicler. I can't stop until the job is done. These things are killing you. Can't you see that, Michael? He slumped over his keyboard, resting his head against it, making a line of letters as he did so. Don't you... don't you think I would if I could? If I stop, if I could stop, I would give so much to stop. The things they tell me, no one should have to know these things. It's fruit from the poison tree, and I wish I did not have the knowledge that they've given me. Then stop, I said suddenly. Just stop writing. Tell them you refuse to write their story. He looked horrified. Refuse them? I've never refused a story before. What if... What if it stops the door from working? I turned him in his chair and pulled him to me. The door is in your mind, love. The way it manifests is nothing more than your own mind working through your stories. The monsters are of your own making. You control them. They don't control you. At that moment, he looked relieved. He hugged me back and seemed on the verge of tears. I don't think he had ever thought of those nightly excursions as anything but in a literal sense. He had never imagined that these things could be of his own creation, and the knowledge had made him feel free. I'll, I'll tell them tonight then, he said with a smile on his face. I'll tell them that I don't want to write about them anymore. I'll tell Fred that I don't want to continue these stories in the morning. He won't like it, but he'll understand. He went to bed then, and I figured that would be the end of the nightmares. I was... I was wrong. He woke me in the middle of the night, screaming. The back of his hands hit me in the face, and I rolled awake to the sound of him screaming. He was thrashing around, clutching his stomach, and kicking his legs frantically. I tried to wake him. I know everything says not to do that, but I wanted him to wake up. I slapped his face. I threw water on him. I screamed his name, but nothing worked. Someone banged on the door, but I ignored them. I tried in every way I could to help my husband. Finally, he helped himself. We were in the ER. The knocking person had called the paramedics, and they had burst in. They thought someone was being murdered, but they loaded him up and took him straight to the hospital when they saw what was going on. He lay in an ER bed, screaming and kicking, until they finally restrained him. He went right on thrashing and yelling until nearly four in the morning. Then he gasped loudly, like a diver coming up from a deep depth and seemed to come awake. They cut my umbilicus, he said in a tone of the most profound sorrow. They moved him upstairs later that day. The doctor who talked to him was afraid that he might hurt himself, and I was a little worried too. For the next two days, he sat strapped to a hospital bed, fighting sleep. He couldn't sleep, he told me, because he would have no way back without his umbilicus. I would be lost forever, and my consciousness would float forever in that void. He told me how he had told the thing behind the door that he would no longer write its story. I had assured him that it was all in his head, that it was a product of his imagination. When it had burst through the door and screamed, he knew it was all too real. He had run then, fled across the void, but the creature had wings and it had chased him. It, 
It defies description. Its legs were equine, its head like living rock, its body was made of stars. I don't know, dear. Its mouth was full of fiery teeth, and when it lunged at me, I could do nothing but flee. As he had run, the thing had slashed at him. The clawed hand had torn at his umbilicus. Michael said a pain like a rending scythe had torn through his belly, and as he writhed, he could see the fiery teeth sever the root from him. He had caught the end then, using the last of his strength to grab the trailing end and pulled himself out of the dark place a little at a time. He was afraid after that, afraid to go back, afraid of what might be waiting there for him. He fought sleep for the next three days. He would nod and awaken, nod and awaken, but it seemed harder for him to come back every time. He begged his doctor for caffeine pills, for coffee, for anything to keep him awake. But the doctors thought sleep would be the best drug for him. They fiddled with the idea of sedating him, but I forbade it. When they threatened to get the police involved, thinking I was somehow responsible for this, I threatened to call a lawyer. Finally, we reached a shaky standoff. It was moot after day three. I lost the fight first, drifting off as I sat by his bedside. When I awoke, he was gone. He's in the ICU now. His coma is deep, and the doctors are afraid he might have suffered a stroke. They don't know about his nightly travels. Wouldn't believe me if I told them. But I know what's been happening to him. He's adrift in the void now, maybe already dead at the hands of this elder thing, and there's nothing I can do to get him back. But maybe there is something you all can do. My husband could not be the only one traveling to this place. Some of you must have heard the whispers through the door as well. If you see this door, and if you find my husband, please bring him back. I don't know how you would, but please try. And if the creatures on the other side of the door talk to you about things from the other side, please do yourself a favor and listen to them. Don't ever stop listening to them. I wish I had never told him to stop listening. The price you pay for ignoring them might be your life. The price might even be steeper than that. He's sleeping so soundly that I think it's time I got a little nap myself. I trust you can all lock up behind yourself while I sit here and drift off into peaceful oblivion. Thanks for joining me today for Dr. Plague's Cozy Horror, and I do hope you'll come back for many, many more to come. Till next time, Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful day and a spooky evening.